Breaking news, Gary. On Friday, March 15th, the New York Times announced or reported on the settlement between NAR and these commission lawsuits. I believe the headline is powerful realtor group agrees to slash commissions to settle lawsuits. And you know what? I've read the settlement. You've read the settlement. We've gone through all the literature. We've gone through and studied this, looked at it in every which way. And I believe what we can do for our peers, because what we've, not, what I've noticed, what you've noticed, what our team has noticed, is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace, specifically with real estate agents and producing brokers, on what does this mean? What do we do now? And we want to produce some clarity. We want to be a voice of reason, and we want to give you some really specific actionable things you can do to prepare and be ready for any changes that come. Well, let's dig into this because this is something that is actually, for me, Chris, mm. very exciting. I'm also, very excited about this. Um, this settlement is the best possible outcome of the entire lawsuit. And I think everybody needs to understand that. And we're going to unpack what it means for you as a real estate agent, what it means for buyers and sellers and how you can prepare for what's coming mid year. Um, I mean, if, if assuming, if it gets assuming approved. gets approved, right? I think that um, the settlement has not been approved yet. It could take a few to several months for it to actually get approved. But um, you know, the two parties have agreed that this is acceptable to them. And of course they've been factoring in uh, the department of justice uh, concerns about what they wanted to see take place. So assuming that this goes through, um, it would happen. And many of the practices specifically are saying in mid-July is when we would see specific Correct. things taking place in mid-July. So Gary. But, but, but like you said, Chris, I would highly encourage everybody to make these changes now. Yeah, don't regardless wait. of whether it gets approved or not, regardless of when it gets approved, you need to make these changes in your business now. You need to start differentiating yourself from the industry now because this is going to take better care of you and your clients. All right. So maybe we can answer some high level questions first. Um, you know, who's covered by this settlement? Um, over a million NAR members um, are right. released li uh, from liability across the nation. Uh, brokerages owned uh, by members that had a residential transaction volume of $2 billion or below are covered. So pretty much everybody is covered with the exception of agents affiliated with Home Services of America and its related companies and then large brokerages, right? Is that pretty Correct. much the gist of it? That is pretty much the gist of it. And so if, if you're curious about yourself and your brokerage, are you covered? Go talk to your broker. Mm. Like that is the easiest way. Don't don't go in this Google um, <laughs> just go search, search of like and go down the rabbit hole. Go directly to the authority. Go to your broker and say, "Hey, really curious. Are we covered? Or are we not?" And I think even if you're not, um, let's say you're in one of the firms, I'm sure that those firms are going to take care of their people so that they can continue to operate. I think it's really just a matter of time of understanding when they're going to be covered. But, you know, many firms, uh, franchises, you know, some of the big ones have already settled. Um, those yet also have been, uh, they're not approved yet, but it seems like everything is in the work. So I think the most important thing we can do is to help uh, those who are producing agents and brokers know what does this mean to me? What has to change now that these the settlement is in place? Um, the good news is, you know, unless you're one of those large brokerages, you're, you're not going to be putting any money out of pocket, right? There's no money that you're going to be spending as a real estate agent. Right. Um, National Association of Realtors went to work for you and worked to protect you. In that uh, and, and so, like, if if somebody came to me right now, Chris, and said, what do I need to do? Get back to work. Mm. And, and we're going to show you how to do that in a minute. But it's like, ignore this noise. I mean, we've been talking about this noise for months. Ignore the noise. Let's get back to work. And we'll talk about exactly how you do that. I think that the big picture, um, a result of these, you know, just to give everyone an understanding of what the major changes are. Uh, I think the first thing is, the way 
um, in which we work with buyers is going to change a little bit, right? We're going to need to have uh, a buyer's broker agreement or a buyer's representation agreement signed before you start touring a property with that customer. That's a real, that's a big change for a lot of people of having a signed agreement in place. Um, there's certain things that we need to communicate um, in both our listing agreements and our buyer's representation agreements. Um, again, a lot of these aren't anything groundbreaking. You know, most men, there's Gary, you were saying that many uh, states require already a buyer's representation or a buyer's broker right. agreement to be signed. Um, well, so, so I'm actually going to back that up even further, Chris. Not only do a lot of states require it, a lot of brokers mm. require it. So you may already be working with a brokerage where they require you to have a signed buyer agency agreement before the eight, the before the client gets in the car with you. Mm -hmm. And so you're probably looking at this like, uh, this doesn't change anything for me on that, but it does change, like you said, on the communication of fees. So let's actually get into that because one of the big issues um, that the settlement worked to address is um, and, uh, basically NAR has agreed to eliminate any requirement I'm going to end a line that requirement that listing brokers or sellers must make offers of compensation to buyer brokers or buyers representatives. I, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. First okay. off, in my listing agreements with my clients, I have never, ever required them to compensate a buyer's agent, mm -hmm. nor have I ever been required to compensate a buyer's agent as a listing agent. I never have. So this mm -hmm. is like, this is just noise again. And so what does that actually mean? Well, I think I don't know. in this case, it means that that information on if there is compensation coming from the seller or the listing agent to the buyer's agent, to the buyer's broker, um, that it can't be communicated on the MLS. That is the proposed settlement. This is like, to me, Chris, this is the biggest change mm -hmm. that is going to be required should this settlement be uh, be accepted by the judge? And there is, from what we've read, there is no indication that it won't be accepted by the judge. Um, but this is the biggest change that in the MLS, the MLS will no longer allow you in any field, whether it be in agent remarks or in a spe specified buyer agent commission, BAC, a percentage, it will be wiped clean. You will no longer be allowed to communicate via the MLS or any syndication what your compensation to a buyer's agent is. Now, that doesn't prevent sellers or listing agents um, from offering buyers concessions. They just can't do it Correct. via the MLS, right? So Correct. Um, it doesn't prevent us from uh, offering concessions as long as they're not limited to or based on the payment to the buyer broker or representative. Look, right? it, it doesn't it doesn't limit me from doing what I'm already doing, except I just can't advertise what I'm going to compensate a buyer's agent in the MLS. Gotcha. Now there is speculation, there is communication going around saying, well, what it does allow me to do is to have my listings or my broker's listings on my website that do communicate clearly that I am willing to pay a percentage or a fee to a buyer's agent who brings a buyer to my listing. So what does this do actually? It simply limit, limits the uh, communication mode for that fee. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, the Department of Justice is very clear in why they're doing this. They wanted to mandate that because they need to eliminate steering. Mm -hmm. And steering in this manner is they want to eliminate a buyer's agent from steering their buyers away from listings who are compensating buyer's agents less than or zero. Mm -hmm what they're normally or accustomed to receiving from a listing agent. So does this accomplish that uh, through the MLS? Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. But what does that mean? Well, that means if you, you, as a listing agent, you still may opt to offer compensation, but that will have absolutely. to be communicated 
in some other fashion, some other format. Right. Maybe the buyer's agent has to call you or something like that to ask you that so, question. So, right. So, I mean, and so, so what this does is it creates a situation where a buyer's agent has to do two to three minutes more work mm -hmm. to find out if, are they being compensated by the listing agent or are they going to have to collect compensation from their buyer? Um, that's it. Gotcha. Um, so, and, and by the way, the, the, the different methods of communication are there's a telephone, <laughs> there's text messaging, there's websites, there's voicemail. So there are a lot of different methods and modes of communication that we can still utilize per this proposed uh, settlement agreement of how can I communicate if I'm representing a seller, how do I communicate that my seller or I am compensating a buyer's agent when you bring a qualified buyer to the house? There are still ways to do this. It's just going to take a little bit more work than going directly to the MLS to see what that is. I see. And I think the another big change, and we already talked about this a little bit, but I think it has uh, some broad reaching effects, which is the requirement to have a buyer's broker agreement or a buyer's representation agreement signed. Um, this this is huge. Before right. yep. you start showing a property. Now I've heard Correct. estimates, we've heard estimates that it's less than 30% of sales take place with a buyer's you know, representation agreement in place. You know, I, and that's just estimates that I've heard. I don't have like any like hard stat on that, but I've heard that around the industry that it's uh, it's very low. So I speculate that this will be a big change for people because you can't just hop in the car and start showing people a home. You're going to have to get a buyer's representation agreement. And in that buyer's rep representation agreement, it, there are specific things that need to be communicated. Uh, one of them is how we're going to get compensated, like a specific amount. It must be very clear. It cannot be ambigu ambiguous. Right. Now, it can still be a rate or a specific amount, but it has to be very clear. And here's a big one. You're not allowed to, in any sh any way, um, in, in, um, in communicate or say or infer that, the, that your services are for free or at no cost. Well, this, this, is, this is part of the original problem is that real estate agents and a lot of brokers have been educating their agents to say as a buyer's agent, Chris, you're my buyer. You're not going to pay me a fee. In fact, my services are free. Mm -hmm. They're not free. Let's be very, very clear about that. And here's why. Where is all of the money for the transaction coming from? Uh, well, the buyer's lender. The buyer and their banks, right? Yep. So are you essentially paying me for my fee already? Mm. Yes, it is just by way of paying through a sales price that passes through the seller, through the listing broker, and then back to me. Mm. So was it ever free? Absolutely not. And so that is something that is very, very clear. You cannot ever, ever say that ever again, that it is free or that it is discounted or anything. Uh, I think, you know, in the settlement and well, at least in some of the um, information that NAR put out about the settlement, um, they specify that, you know, and I'm just going to read it off my, my list here. Um, they say specifically that the types of compensation available for buyer brokers would continue to take multiple forms depending on the broker consumer negotiations, including but not limited to a fixed fee commission paid directly by consumers, concession from the seller or a portion of the listing broker's compensation. So that's you know, traditionally what most people were used to. But all three of these things are ways in which that is a negotiable thing. I think having that, having that conversation though for a lot of people is going to be the big change because in order to get that buyer's representation agreement signed, I'm going to have to explain how I get paid. Now, for anyone who's not used to articulating that or explaining that to a buyer, there's a little hurdle to overcome there. Right. Because now you for you, this wasn't a big deal because you had told me that, um, you know, if you were going to show a buyer, for example, a FISBO or an expired listing. Right. In those cases, there's no listing agent compensation taking place. Right. So you right. would so, have to collect it from the buyer from the buyer. So 
this, I think, is uh, is something that's very interesting, um, but is obviously going to become a standard requirement by law, is that, yes, from day one in my real estate career, I have always worked to get and have always gotten a buyer representation agreement from every buyer before I go show them homes. Why is that? Because I need to, as a professional, assure myself and my broker that I will be compensated for the work that I'm going to do on behalf of this buyer. Mm -hmm. Now, in my buyer representation agreement, it has always been clear that this is my brokerage fee. They charge this in order for me to represent you as a buyer. Um, and that was always clearly stated in my buyer representation agreement. The reason we always had that is that uh, as a professional, I need to trust my buyer that they're going to work with me and they need to trust that I am going to represent them. And that includes a fee structure. This is how I'm going to be compensated for the work and knowledge that I'm going to provide you. It includes FISBOs, withdrawns, expires. So if I were not, or my broker was not compensated, the fee that we charge for my services by the seller or the seller's agent, that the buyer would be responsible for covering that. I never had a client balk on that. And it's because I articulated my value from day one. And I think this is, if, if we really discuss what are the biggest changes that buyers, agents, and brokers are going to need to uh, adopt, it starts way before we actually have a buyer representation agreement signed or produced and presented to a buyer. It starts way before we get the buyer in the car. It starts from that initial conversation and articulating our value and why we demand what we demand. So I think this is where we advocate the use of a process, right? We have a, a buyer process and we have a, a listing process or a seller process. Um, you know, on the buy side of the equation, you know, we're going to do an initial consultation, right? And, and that's where we start to build trust. That's where we start to build rapport. It's where we start to really understand what their motivations are. Ultimately, what's taking place is we are getting to know each other. And then, you know, we will send out some information before we get together with the buyer. Long before getting, uh, showing a home and touring any homes, uh, we want to send some information to begin further articulating that value, showing them why they're, why they're hiring us, right? We need to give people really concrete reasons why, why they are hiring us and why they're compensating us, right? It goes both ways, not just why you're hiring me, but why are you paying my fees? That needs to be clear in any every transaction. It doesn't matter whether it's real estate or anything. That should be clear. Otherwise, people could be unhappy with with and they don't understand what they're paying for. Um, so you know this process that we would advocate is you know having that initial conversation or initial consultation, sending some information, and then actually getting together to consult with the buyer before you start right. showing homes, so that you can cement the value that you're going to provide explain the terms and set expectations and explain the terms of the agreement, which includes compensation. But at this point, because you have taken time to build trust, because you've taken time to set expectations and show your value and, and give them concrete reasons why they're hiring you and why they're paying your fees, when you get to explaining the uh, compensation and going through the options that are available, it's a lot easier, right? It's a lot easier right. at that point. Well, it's so the ultimate goal here is to um, show your value, share that with them so that by the time you start talking about money and signing an agreement, it's a foregone conclusion mm -hmm. because you have built superior trust with them that they automatically just say, oh, I don't want to navigate this without Gary. I don't want to go buy, like try and search and buy and negotiate uh, a house without Gary because we trust him to take care of our concerns. So of course I will pay that fee if he's not collecting it from somewhere else or he's disclosing I'm going to work to collect my fee from these different places and this is how we can do this. 
So there's superior trust built. Mm -hmm. And here's one of the reasons there is superior trust built, transparency. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the situation got to where it is now anyway, is because there was a lack of transparency and I'm not sure why. My only my my only thought or guess is because uh, real estate agents have traditionally been fearful of putting a contract in front of somebody saying sign this and pay me. And so I, I, I would if I didn't if I if I hadn't built rapport if I haven't uh, shown people my value I would be afraid to do that as well. I mean because you're just like sticking a contract in front of somebody Fair saying spy it and say yeah. sign it. So I think. It, because many of us, many people lack a good process for getting to that point in the relationship where someone is going to sign an agreement, is fully in understanding of what they're agreeing to, and they trust you to do a good job for them. Yeah, if you haven't done that, if you haven't done those steps leading to it, of course it would be uncomfortable. I think what there's unfortunately been an opportunity for people to have some bad habits over the years, right? So, hey, I want to go see a home. All right, let me go show it to you without any kind of understanding of and setting any kind of expectation. Like that's a bad habit. It has worked for some people, maybe a lot of people, um, but that's a bad habit that, you know, ultimately doesn't serve us, doesn't serve our industry, doesn't serve our consumers very well. Um, mm -hmm. This settlement and the practices that are going to change are going to demand that we now have good habits and that we, you know, I think knowing that there are solutions out there though, like here's, I think the big thing is you don't have to worry and say, oh my goodness, now I'm not going to get paid. No, what you need to focus on is, well, what is a more effective process to explain my buyer's broker or buyer's representation agreement and how I get compensated, right? That's what you should be focused on. Not worried about, oh, now we're not going to get paid. Now no one's going to, no, the thing that we can work on is having a better process. This is just having an effective sales process. Um, and when you have that in place, you can trust the process to produce the outcome. Now, it may mean, it may mean there are some customers that can that will not want to pay you for your for your services, and you're going to have to say no to those people. But guess what? Those were people probably you should have not been working with in the first place, right? Like there will be a few of those, but it is okay to say no to someone who doesn't want to pay you. In fact, I would well, say... So, so let me ask you this, Chris. Um, have you ever hired an attorney to do anything like estate planning yeah. or anything? Okay, so you have. And so when they came to you with their, free, with their fee structure, did you say, I'm not paying you for all of your knowledge and expertise and all your work? No, I mean, I, I, we, my wife and I, we had, uh, you know, like the, the will and the estate planning. And I remember before we started doing anything, they told me what their fee was. Exactly. I had to sign a little piece of paper saying that I will pay for this service. In fact, I even had to do a little down payment on it. Um, and they, this is what I was going to get and explained everything I was going to get. And, and we engaged based on that understanding. So that's part of my question is like, why do we in real estate feel like uh, we can't do the same? Hmm. It's simply something that has been ingrained in us since the beginning of time that now the DOJ came in and said, we're putting a stop to that. Mm. And thank goodness they have. So I want everybody to rest assured that what has or what is proposed to be approved is a very good thing for consumers and realtors alike. Buyer's agents are not going away. Listing agents can still compensate buyer's agents. What does this mean, though? Like, there's so much power in being a listing agent, but there's also power in building trust with your buyers mm -hmm. by articulating your value from the very beginning. This is no different than what we teach at the paperless agent to our customers and cons or, 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 and agents every single day, is that there is a process in order to build trust, to brand yourself as that expert, whether it's buyer's agent or listing agent expert, and to have your clients build that superior trust with you so that when you put that piece of paper in front of them and ask them to sign, there are not objections because you've already handled their concerns through the process. That change, by the way, is to go into effect in mid-July. So you have some time. 
Um, if you're looking for a good buyer process, I encourage you to go check out our blog, uh, Search Paperless Agent uh, Buyer Presentation, I think it's called, or Buyer Consultation. And we have a three-step process that's outlined uh, for you to follow. Now, let's talk about the other side of the equation. What would change for a listing agent? And one of the things that um, is a, maybe a slight change for some people, I, actually I don't think it is because when you had, this is probably articulated in, in every single listing agreement that's out there, but it says, you know, agents uh, acting for sellers, i.e. the listing agent, must disclose to sellers and obtain written approval for any compensation or offer of compensation that the listing broker or seller will make to the buyer's broker, agent, or representative. This is called a listing agreement. Mm. We have been required, by the way, for forever since I've been in the business to obtain a signed listing agreement before we can put a listing on the market. We cannot represent a seller without that. Ever since 1997, when I got into real estate, there has always been a form called a listing agreement that clearly states that this is what my broker's fee is. And of that fee, if the buyer is represented by a buyer's agent, this is what my broker is going to compensate the buyer's agent for. Now, is that going to change? No, I don't expect that to change at all. The only thing that is going to change is the method of communication of what that fee is. And I do anticipate a brokerage arrangement document to be instituted in every state. And what that is, that's an agreement between brokers that as we are bringing you this offer, you agree to pay my firm this. Mm. That's the only shift that I anticipate. Now, let me ask you this, Gary. Do you think because of the news cycles and because of um, you know the attention that the settlement and these lawsuits have gotten, do you anticipate a situation where a seller might balk at offering compensation to the buyer's broker, to the buyer's agent? Yes, absolutely. If the listing agent has not done a good job of building superior trust with their seller, mm. that's the only reason. And, and, and the reason is because there's so much clickbait material out there that these news outlets are putting out to consumers that are saying, Real estate commissions are gone forever. Mm. Realtors will no longer make any more money. Real estate is now going to become affordable because we're wiping out the realtor. Like all of this is clickbait and it's noise. Now, one thing that we always teach our members at the paperless agent is pay attention to the news because we need to understand what our consumers are seeing, mm -hmm. but don't buy into the hype. What you buy into is your professionalism and becoming that expert. So do I anticipate any of my sellers coming to me saying, I don't really want to pay you a fee or I don't really want you to pay a buyer's agent a fee. Do I expect that to happen? I don't. Well, this is, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, isn't a seller saying that and coming to you saying, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to pay for that buyer's agent. Um, is this any different than a seller saying, Gary, uh, I know you want to charge this much, but I want you to discount your fee. Right. Or is this any different than saying, when saying, Gary, I know you're saying that the home is worth this much, but I think we should list it at this price instead. Is this, this is basically could potentially be another seller objection, right? It is, it, it absolutely is another potential seller objection. And what you and I discuss all the time is how do you overcome these objections? You don't. Well, why? Because we handle the objections because be, before they become right. objections, because they are concerns that they're thinking about. But as we, huge terms, articulate our value, show them that we are that expert who is professionally designed and knowledgeable to take care of their concerns, their fiduciary concerns in this transaction. They are going to have that superior trust with us so that these are not objections. Which is why we have our three-step 
listing appointment process, right? And it's very similar to the buyer one, right? We start off Correct. with an initial consultation. Where we're gathering information, building trust, making building rapport, um, understanding their motivation, uh, sending a pre-listing packet, you know, with information, again, showing them why they should hire us and why they will want to pay our fees to hire us and, and right. our differentiation in the marketplace and all that good stuff. And then our actual listing presentation where we go on an appointment and walk them through our value proposition, walk them through, they have a full understanding and set expectations of what we're going to do, what they're going to do, right? This goes along with not just from compensation, but what are they gonna to do to prepare the home, right? There has to be an expectation around all of these things. Um, and then we get to you know signing the paperwork, which is where we are going to talk about these options. Um, and when you've done a really good job at building trust, educating your customer on what you're going to do and what the value of that is and what they need to do. When you get to the conversation about compensation, your compensation, potentially offering compensation to a buyer's broker um, or what those options are, now they, they trust your expertise. They trust your advice. They're going to say, well, Gary, what do you think is the best thing we should do? Correct. That is exactly what is going to happen. And I will share with you, that is exactly what happened to me this weekend. Mm because I had met with a friend uh, who was flipping a house and he had already negotiated terms to have the listing agent discount their commission drastically. Uh, but he started asking me questions, started asking me about advice, started asking me, is my agent proposing what I should actually be doing? I said, well, do you have an assigned agreement with them yet? I said, he said, no. And I said, okay, then I can, I can actually speak with you about this. And so we started discussing that. And I started discussing in general terms of when clients hire me at my firm, these are the things that we do in order to take care of our clients in the best manner possible. By the end of the conversation, he's already asking me, do you have time to come take a look at this house we're flipping? Mm. Because I need it. I need your advice. I, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, superior trust has been built. He is now considering not hiring this other agent and paying me a much larger fee because of trust. Mm -hmm. And so as you follow this process and this procedure and you have that knowledge and you convey that knowledge in the manner that we teach, all of a sudden, these objections go out the window because you never even get to a point where they are objections. They're just thoughts in the client's mind. But if you handle those objections as concerns and you address them before you even get down that path, it's not going to be an objection. Now, does that mean you're not going to have a listing appointment where a client is going to say, well, Gary, will you discount your fee? That does not mean that you're not going to get to a point to where a client would say, I don't really want to pay you that fee because I don't want you to compensate the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they're not going to say, well, Gary, I know based on all of your research and knowledge, you're telling me a buyer is willing to pay 750,000 for our house, but we want 800. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that's not going to happen? No. What it means is that when you get to that point and they ask that, you will have superior trust already built with them so that when you explain to them again and educate them again as to why that is not the case, instead of them battling with you and arm wrestling and getting angry, they're like, makes sense. I just had to ask. All right. At this point, when you've done a good job through your process of showing your value, educating them, setting expectations. You can then treat the objections as an opportunity to educate instead of trying to do, and you know, there, there were a lot of um, like just bad evidence, you know, like during a lot of the, the cases, there was bad evidence of people from real estate teaching real estate agents to say things that were like redirecting or sort of distracting or trying to sweep the issue under the carpet instead of just facing it head on, which is exactly right. what you should do is face the issue head on because it's always a lack. It's, it's always a gap in their understanding that you can actually educate them on and help them understand so that, because be honest, when someone's being redirected or being there, you know, you're arm wrestling them into submission on it, 
that's not a good client experience, right? That's not it's good. It's not a good them. client experience. And you know what happens in the end, Chris? They're going to be angry. They're going to be mm-hmm. dissatisfied. They're not going to refer their friends, their family, their contacts and connections to you. That is a transactional realtor mm-hmm. who is in the business just for that transaction. Right. That's not me. I'm in for that lifetime. Well, and I think instead, when you become that trusted advisor, when you're educating and informing and educating and trying to understand and be curious, you know, I think that- Oh, oh, oh yeah, curious. When people That's ask you problem. questions is to be curious because you, it's, it's way more helpful for you to be curious to try and understand, well, where is the gap in their understanding that I can inform them than trying to be defensive or trying to, you know, I think one of the worst things that could happen is where people have the argument about their value, right? Like, don't be defensive. You need to help first understand why is this question coming up? Well, that's an interesting question. Let me ask you a question. What makes you think that, right? Why would you? Such a powerful thing is just being curious. Like you just said, Chris, you know, there are so many scripts and dialogues out there from brokers who uh, are who who have these scripts in place to be defensive mm-hmm. and to steer the conversation in a certain way. And instead of asking what you just said is, well, oh, Chris, you know, that seems like it's really important to you. Do you mind if I ask why mm-hmm. that is? Mm-hmm. Oh, all of a sudden, don't you feel heard as a customer? Don't you feel like I'm curious, like I actually care about you? You know, what I think what this does, Chris, this entire situation kind of gets us as real estate agents back to, for the most part, back to the core of the reason we got into real estate in the first place. Mm. And it's because we care. We care about relationships. We care about people. We care about helping them achieve their goals when it comes to real estate, homes, investments, commercial properties, whatever it may be having to do with real estate. We, for the most part, as realtors, got into this business because we care. Mm -hmm. And what this settlement does, if it's accepted, reminds us we care. Well, I think this is actually, you started off by saying this could be a very big opportunity. And if anyone who's watching this is the kind of person who cares, who cares about their customer, who cares about being a professional, I believe those are the people who will ultimately win. Why is that? Because the people who don't care, the people who aren't caring about being professional, they will likely get either less business or leave the business, right? Or in time, which means if there's less people and there's more of us who care and who are professional, there is actually, there's the same amount of homes are, up, are going to sell, right? <laughs> Approximately the we same. We just get home. a bigger piece of that pie. We're just going to get a much bigger piece of that pie. And if you think about it, it does, you know, one of the things, and this is a speculation on my part, I speculate that it does make the barrier to entry a little bit higher. Not to get your license and to work, start working with a brokerage, but to be successful, right? You have to now have fundamental sales skills, good sales skills, to be able to give people reasons why they should hire you, to be able to set those expectations, to be able to explain compensation, right? That's gonna be, that's a professional. And that means maybe not the barrier to entry, but the barrier to success has been raised, will be raised as a result of these settlements. And that's not a bad thing, right? For those of us who care about our customer and care about being a professional. So in that way, in that regard, I think there's, maybe a silver lining there that we could look to is that there could be more opportunity for us in the future. Oh, I'm excited, Chris. I am really excited about this. I do believe that this is a huge opportunity for those of us who adhere to those values and principles to raise our level, to become the the creme de la creme that will be hired above all else because of that superior trust. And so that is our wish for you. We wanted you to understand what does this actually mean to you? And then how do you prepare? How do you behave differently? How do you make sure that when a customer is asking you questions, that you have the appropriate answer and curiosity and the mood in order to care for them and to take care of yourself at the same time? Well, Gary, If anybody has more questions about 
our buyer process, our listing process, I encourage you to search our website, uh, search our blog. We've got articles with uh, resources and lots of information so that you can start uh, having a better process to get to the outcomes. Um, we encourage you to not be afraid and to um, you know confidently move forward in working to be prepared because these changes are right around the corner should the settlement be approved. And by the way, these are changes that many of us should be doing anyway, getting those buyer's representation agreements signed and making sure that we're very clear about how those uh, buyer's agents may be potentially compensated that when we're working with a seller. If you wanna continue getting more episodes of The Chris and Gary Show, we encourage you to like and subscribe to our channel and we'll see you in the next episode. Take care.